Well, we're going to spend our time in the Word this morning considering some of our values as we move into this next chapter of life together as a church. And so I'm going to list off uh, several, actually eight different priorities that we have as a uh, community of faith, and we'll see uh, if we get through all of them. I'm mindful of the the heat for those of you that are in the sun. Uh, I tend to shorten things depending on the circumstances. Shortest talk I ever gave was actually at Courtney and Steve's wedding. We were in Palm Desert, and it was 118 uh, degrees out, and so as you can imagine, that was very brief, and uh, we made sure everyone made it home alive that day. Uh, and so I think about that when we gather outside, and, and I don't want you guys to be uncomfortable, so I will try to stop before you do. Um, but let's pray, and we'll jump into the word together. Lord, we ask right now that you, Lord, by your word, would speak to each of us. As we consider who we're becoming as a family of faith, Lord, uh, as we kind of put these priorities out there, I pray that it would resonate with each of us. That these wouldn't just be ideas that I have, but that this would be a shared vision that we can pursue together. So Lord, by your spirit, through your word, have your way. Amen. Amen. Eight different things about our church, eight different priorities or values, if you will. First off, we are a gospel-centered church. The gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ dying in our place. It is at the very heart and essence of Christianity. And so we want our church to reflect that reality. We want for the gospel to be the main thing. Um, I believe that uh, if you're reading scripture and you're, you're wondering what is it all about, this is the very core of the entire message. The Bible really is the message of Jesus Christ crucified and risen to redeem a people, to restore a people into a right relationship with God, their maker. And so we prioritize that. It is not just the entry point of Christianity. It is the ongoing reality that, most, that all of us most desperately need. In the words of Tim Keller, he says, it's not the ABCs. The gospel is the A to Z. It is the, it's the whole thing. And so as a church, we want to make sure that we are prioritizing the gospel. Let me show it to you from scripture now in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, this is how it reads, and we'll put it up on the screens as well. It says, now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. So he's putting this idea out there. He's saying, I want to remind you of this significant truth, this gospel that was preached to you and on which you've taken your stand and by which you are saved. And this is something that he goes on to say, you have to hold firmly to this word that was preached to you. So it's this ongoing reality. And then he describes it in verses three and following. Here's what it is. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. That's very important. We'll pick that up in a minute. But he's defining the gospel here. Here's what it is. That Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And then he made appearances to Peter, to the 12, to more than 500 brothers and sisters at the same time. He says, most of whom are still living, though some of them have fallen asleep. That's an idiom for passing away. He's saying, look, this is what the good news is. Jesus Christ came, he lived, he died, he was buried, and he rose again, and all of this happened according to the plan of God. And this is not just some idea, this is a historical fact. He appeared to people. This is a reality that happened in time and space, and therefore you can examine it for yourself. But if it is true, and that's the argument that he's making in 1 Corinthians 15, if it is true, this is everything. If it's not true, Christianity is pretty worthless. If it is true, however, that Jesus Christ came and did these things, he died, he was buried, he rose again, according to what the scriptures actually predicted would happen, then this is everything. It is a matter of first importance. It is the most important thing that we could rally around then. The gospel is at the very core and essence of who we are as a church. We want to be a gospel-centered church. We want to prioritize the good news of the gospel in everything that we do. Now, this shows up as well in our statement of faith. 
as we think through our beliefs, what we believe, we say, okay, well, we've got matters of first importance. We're going we're gonna to put that out in the lead. We're going to say, this is really what we can rally around. Um, if you think about our congregation, we've got people from all different walks of life. 85 of us were from Central Christian Church, a part of the Christian Church movement, the Restoration Movement, and we launched this campus. We picked up people from Lutheran backgrounds. We want to keep them on board as we move ahead. We've picked up people from Baptist backgrounds, Southern Baptist, American Baptist, USA. We've picked up people from all these different places. We've picked up people from charismatic churches like... Uh, like Assemblies of God and, and vineyard churches and other places like that. And, and so the question then is, well, how on earth, core do you expect to keep everyone together? If you're coming from a diverse experience of backgrounds, how on earth do you, do you ever imagine you're going to be able to hold all these people together? Well, here's how. The gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel, the matter of first priority, we're going to lead with that. We're going to say, this is what we can all agree on. This is not lowest common denominator theology, but we're just saying this is our rallying point. And then we build out concentric circles. This is first importance. Then we've got convictions. Then we've got preferences. Now, these other areas we can have discussions about. We can have disagreements about. But on matters of first importance, we say this is what we are about. We are about Jesus Christ crucified and risen for us. So there's a prioritization of the gospel. We are a gospel-centered church. It is at the core of who we are. It will be a key feature of everything that we do. Secondly, we're a word-driven church. We are a people who believe that this is God's word, that God communicates to us by this book, that through his spirit, by his spirit, through this word, he actually speaks to us today. And so the way that we design church and the different things that we do together reinforces that conviction. It's not simply that we can't think of anything better to do than to open the Bible. We actually believe that if by doing this, God will show up and he will be glorified. So let me show it to you then from scripture. This is 2 Timothy 3, verses 15 to 17. And um, the verses actually land in the middle of a sentence. So Paul is writing to Timothy and he's explaining some things and we're gonna pick it up in verse 15. But he says, from infancy, Timothy, from infancy, you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. He's saying, look, dude, ever since you were a boy, you were exposed to the Scriptures. You have a spiritual heritage. You have, believing, you have a believing mom and a believing grandmother, and they opened the word to you. And he says, you know these Scriptures, but they're not ordinary Scriptures. They're not just like words on a page. This is God's word. These scriptures are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. He's saying that even the Bible that they had at that point, because the New Testament wasn't completed, but what they had to that point, the Old Testament scriptures were able to bring people to saving faith in Jesus Christ. Then he goes on to say it like this, all scripture, verse 16, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Bible, then, is useful for us. It is the, the instrument that we need to ensure that we are pursuing what God wants for us. This is God's word to us, and it can accomplish all the things that we hope to do as a church. So we believe in the power of scripture. We are a word-driven church. That informs how, how we design our services. We read the scriptures. That might seem boring to you. Like, dude, I know how to read. I can do this at home. You know, you just tell me what section we're going to do. I could read that myself. You're going to stand up in front of a group of people and read? Boring. But what if that's actually a conviction that reading the scriptures publicly is an important thing to do? Paul, in another letter writing to, to Timothy, he says, devote yourself to this. Devote yourself to the public reading of scripture and prayer. 
So as a church, we say, look, we're a word-driven church. This is a conviction of ours. We believe God speaks to us through this. And so a part of our service will actually be the naked reading of scripture. There's no music accompanying it. There's nothing else going on at the same time. We just say, God, speak to us. We're going to read it. We're going to listen. And we're going to believe that you can communicate to us. And it can be a profound thing. And by doing that week by week, you actually are being exposed to a tremendous amount of the Bible. This week I've been working on our website and the library of resources that we have and just going through the stuff we've done together over the last few years. And I think you'll be surprised by the amount of Bible that you've encountered if you've been a part of this church week by week. That is a conviction of ours, that God speaks through his word so we follow suit and design our church accordingly. We preach the scriptures, whether it's myself or another member from our congregation standing up here, we are preaching the scriptures. And you'll notice that it informs both the content and the style, that the content is full of the Bible. I prefer to take kind of paragraphs or bigger chunks and say, if it, I'm going to let God have his way in this time. And I'm just going to read it, and then we're going to try to explain and apply it so that we all walk out of here with the confidence that we've heard from God and we understand what the expectation is then for this week. The style, as you think through the, the style of preaching that I've been doing now this whole time, you might think, okay, well, that's not the most impressive kind of preaching, and I agree with that. But as a conviction, this is what I want to do. I love how Paul, in another place, he talks about how he doesn't speak with wisdom or eloquence, but he comes with fear and trembling. He believes that the power of the gospel is enough. And so that is also my conviction, and I believe that the style of preaching and the style of the services that we perform ought to revolve around what God says to us in his word. So the word is going to, in the words of Martin Luther, the word is going to do the work. God is going to do the work by speaking to us. The late P.T. Forsyth, he put it like this, if we're not going to use our Bibles, it's of no use building our churches. We're not just trying to put out a design for here's how we're going to do church we're going to footnote it with scriptures. We're going to kind of reference scriptures, but really we've got a plan and we're just going to go after it and try to build this thing. No, we believe that God can accomplish what he wants to accomplish through his word by his spirit. So we are a word driven church. Third, we are a relational church. We believe that being in relationship is a part of the Christian experience. We want everybody to have opportunities to make deep connections with one another. We think it's very important that you do not do Christianity alone, but that you actually find a community of people that you're doing life together with. We want everyone to be in these sorts of relationships and we design things in that way and we understand that we're fighting against cultural trends. This is an individualistic society that we live in. We prefer, I prefer doing things alone. We don't always like to involve other people in the ordinariness of life, but this is something that we have to press into. This is something that we have to pursue together because this is a part of the calling to be Christians in this world. Jesus in John 13, speaking to his disciples and all who would come after, the, after them, put it like this. This is John 13, 35. He said, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. Imagine how you might fill that in. By this, everyone will know that you are a follower of Jesus Christ. How would you fill that in? By your personal devotions, your Bible reading and prayer, by your um, demonstrative worship, by your serving other people? No, he says, no, here's how people will know that you are my disciples. Everyone will know you are my disciples by this. If you love one another, it's relationship. He's saying, look, people are going to notice how you deal with each other, and that actually is going to be a compelling argument for the truth of the gospel. People are going to see how you relate, and they're going to come to the conclusion, these people follow Jesus Christ. Now, I'm aware that this is hard, and I'm also honest enough to say I'm horrible at this. But we believe that our groups can be a place where this comes true. And um, we're going to aim in this direction, even if we're not fully doing it at this moment, but we're aiming in this direction. Francis Schaeffer puts it like this. He says, this is the final apologetic of the gospel. 
Apologetic would be kind of the defense or the argument for it. This is the, the reasoning that proves that it's true. He's saying communities who, who do life together on mission are the apologetic of the gospel. They are the things that make Christianity plausible for people. So we want to be in relationship with one another. We believe that that can happen in group settings where we're saying, look, I'm going to have some people that I'm doing life together with. We're doing life on mission, and there's going to be a, a real connectedness here. And our groups aren't just a place to do a Bible study. We're not just mainly concerned about getting content covered. That's a part of it. Sure, we, we need that. We need to study the Bible together. But we want to do life together so that we can encourage each other, love each other, assist each other, and, and do life on mission together. We want to have open homes and open tables. We want to mingle the Christian community with the watching world. We want neighbors to come in and to see the way that we interact with each other and say, they must follow Christ. They must be followers of his because look at how they deal with each other. Again, I am horrible at this. Some of my group are here today and they can say, yeah, dude, you're not doing that, but at least we're aiming in that direction. And that's an ambition that we have. We want to be a relational church. And um, it's going to be something that all of us have to buy into and move in that direction. All right, we want to be a missional church. The fourth thing I've got down here is we are a missional church. We believe that the real identity of the people of God is that of the missionary people of God that God sends us in his name with his authority to be his representatives in the world. Let's look at John 20, 22. Jesus said, peace be with you. As the father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. But here's what I want you to notice. He is telling his followers, just like he has been sent he sends us. Just like he has been sent by the Father, he sends us in his name. We are the missionary people of God. It means that wherever we go, we go in his name and in his authority. We go on his errands. We have his purposes in mind, and we want to embrace that so that we're thinking about, okay, we gather together on a Sunday. That's a part of our, our church experience, but that's a small part. In fact, a very small part compared to the reality that our entire lives are a part of the mission of God. We scatter from here and we go to different workplaces and into our different families and circles of friends and neighbors and, and we go as represent, representatives of Jesus Christ. We go as the missionary people of God. So the philosophy of ministry then is missional, meaning we care more about equipping you to go than trying to get other people to come, okay? We, we, let, let me give you a couple different categories so you can think through it. Th this is language, I think, from Rick Warren of Saddleback. He said, what, what matters when you pursue a missional philosophy of ministry is the difference between seeding capacity and sending capacity. Seeding capacity is how many people can we get together for our events? How many people can we get to, to register for the stuff that we produce? We're going to be programmatic. We're going to create opportunities for people to worship. We're going to create oppor opportunities for people to serve. We'll create opportunities for people to pray. We'll create opportunities for whatever you need as a Christian. We'll do it for you. And we'll measure the seating capacity, how many people show up. And we'll pat ourselves on the back. If it's a big number, we'll be really discouraged if it's small. Missional philosophy of ministry says what we're going to care about is sending capacity. What we're going to measure is not what we're doing for you, but what you are doing. Your capacity to live on mission is the thing that we measure. Your ability to go away from here and to live on mission with the other members of this church, that is a big deal. And so we're a missional church. We're trying to encourage and equip you to go and do life together on mission. So that involves evangelism. We're an evangelistic church. We want people to hear the news of the gospel and to come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. Matthew 28 puts it like this. This is Jesus speaking, and he says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, 
He's saying, all authority is mine, and I am now sending you to go and make disciples. How are disciples made? They hear the news of the gospel, and they respond by faith. That is the making of a disciple. We want to do that. We want to equip you to share your personal testimony. We want to equip you to share the good news of the gospel. We want you to feel comfortable that if you were in an elevator with somebody and you had 30 seconds to explain what the gospel is, you would feel totally, well, not totally, you might feel terrified, but you would feel capable of doing this. I know what the gospel is and I can share it and I can believe that the Holy Spirit could use that to change somebody's eternity, to bring about salvation. So we want you to be sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. We want to be evangelistic as you go to your workplace. We want you to be thinking about, this is my mission field. These are the people that I have relational capital with, and I'm going to leverage that for the sake of advancing the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we are an evangelistic church, but we are also a disciple-making church. Jesus didn't stop there and say, make disciples. He continued on, and he described what would need to happen from there. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. He says, don't just make disciples, baptize them into this experience and then equip and train them, teach them everything I've commanded you. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean to do discipleship? Does it mean produce courses? Like if we're going to disciple people, we just have to get them the content? No, no, no. Think about how Jesus did discipleship. What was his strategy? Three years, life on life. You come with me, you live with me, you watch me, you observe from me. There will be lessons peppered in here. I'll teach you some things along the way, but you need to watch and see what Christianity is really like. As a disciple-making church, we want you to open your life to other people and say, come and do this with me, and you will see the Christ life on display. We care about disciple-making. Dawson Trotman, the founder of Navigators, he would put it like this. He would say to people, where is your man? He would say to young men, where is your man? I'm, I'm, I'm really thrilled if you can share your faith and somebody becomes a Christian, but then what? Where are they? Are you helping them grow to maturity in Christ? We don't just want to create spiritual orphans. We don't just want people to become Christians and then say, good luck. It's on you from here on out. We can point you in a certain direction. No, we want to say, if you're now a follower of Christ, you are my responsibility. And I'm going to walk beside you and help you along the way. I'll hustle through these next two. I see you getting warm. Um, Let's hustle through these next two. We care about discipleship. We're a disciple-making church. Number seven, we are a spirit-filled church. We believe in the Holy Spirit of God filling his people, and that is what makes us special. John 20, verses 21 and 22, we already referenced this, but look at it again. It says, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Harrison loves Cheez-Its right now, and Reese hates them, and Harrison will be eating Cheez-Its, and he'll go sit next to Reese just to bug her, and he'll be like, "Ah," and breathe on her, and it drives her bonkers. Um, Jesus breathes on them, and you might go, okay, that's kind of strange, but what is he doing here? No, he's doing something symbolic of, I am giving you my spirit. I am giving you my spirit. In order for you to accomplish what we've already laid out here, you will need the Holy Spirit of God in you. This is not something we can do in our own strength or ingenuity. This is something that we will be desperate for God to show up. And if he doesn't, it's not going to work. And if we can do something without him, I'm not interested. We are pursuing this incredible mission of being spirit-filled and advancing the kingdom of God on this earth. So we need the Spirit of God. In the words of Ray Ortland Jr., he says, without the Spirit, we get dry. Without the Word, though, we get weird. We need both, right? We, we don't just, we just want to be all Word all the time and be dry. That would be kind of where I land on the spectrum. But we need the Word, otherwise we get weird. Some of you are on that weird spectrum. 
And I get that. We need each other. We're going to do this life together on mission, and we're going to do it filled with the Holy Spirit of God, and we're going to believe that God is going to show up in a profound way. Finally, we are a worshiping church. We are a worshiping church. We, we want to help you be a life, lifestyle worshiper, meaning not just coming together on a Sunday and lifting your voices, but being able to do that in all the nitty-gritty details of life. 1 Corinthians 10 puts it like this. This is verse 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. There's this way about Christianity where everything that you do can become an act of worship. Romans 12 describes it like this. You are a spiritual sacrifice. You are offering your life as the spiritual sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your act of worship, your life for God doing everything for God. We want to help you do that. We want you to go to work worshiping. We want you to parent while worshiping. We want you to do your schoolwork worshiping. We want you to be an unceasing worshiper. And we expect then that we'll also come together as a body and worship together. Sunday mornings will be those moments where we punctuate our week-long experience of worship with a shared experience together. Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. Let us, consent, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. We want to be a worshiping people who are doing it on our own and then coming together as a church family and worshiping God because of what he has done, encouraging each other, equipping each other, and then deploying so we can go and do life on mission. And we do that mindful of the fact that one day he will return and we want him to find us as good and faithful servants. People who are doing his work in this world. People who are representing him well. And so with that in mind, let me pray and I'll invite the band to come again and we'll worship together. If you would, please stand and I'll pray over us and then we'll step into worship. Lord, as we this morning have reminded ourselves of some of the priorities that you've placed on this family of faith. I'm praying that you would help each of us to embrace these different values, that we would get excited about them, that we would share them, that we would cherish them, that we would be champions of them. Lord, we're grateful that you call together communities of faith to be your church and, and embassy of heaven in a broken world. We want to represent you well. We want our church to be a place where people come to know the Savior, Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, help us to do that. Give us more of yourself. We need you. We can't do this on our own. Give us more of you, Lord. We pray in your name. Amen. Amen.